Hi, I'm Susan Fowler, and I'm one of the collaborating authors on this wonderful book, You Matter. And I'd like to read my chapter to you. It's called The Power of Building a Bigger Heart. And it's a personal story, but I hope that it has resonance and that you might actually learn something or maybe even shift a perspective because of it. It begins with a quote by Gracian, who says, the sole advantage of power is that you can do more good. So here's my chapter. Why is she so ugly? The words had no sooner left my mouth than my mother stopped the rocking chair and stared at me with disbelief. Her message was direct. You will never call your little sister ugly again. She is a gift, a beautiful gift. It wasn't easy thinking of Terry as a gift, especially a beautiful one. To my five-year-old eyes, she was a wrinkled, twisted little thing with an oversized head due to water on the brain. Born with spina bifida, a congenital disability, Terry's spine hadn't fully formed. I would gasp in disgust as fluid leaked from the open hole in her back by the potful. I silently cried at night as this new baby seemed to demand every moment of my mother's and father's time and energy. Our lives had changed forever. Despite dire warnings that Terry would not survive, she did. The doctors set low expectations though, telling us she would never gain mentality beyond that of a three-year-old. We were often exasperated and saddened by Terry's condition, but we were also in awe as her shriveled body started to fill out. Paralyzed from the waist down, it was apparent Terry would never walk, but she tried. Her heavy, bulky, and ill-fitting braces and crutches calloused her hands and dug deep holes at her waist. When Terry was around six years old, I found myself admiring more than her spunk. Her light brown curls framed beautiful blue eyes. I told my mother I could see something behind those big eyes that doctors kept insisting didn't exist. Intelligence. Inspired by what I thought I saw, I decided to teach Terry to read. I taught my other siblings to read before they ever reached school age. I made little workbooks out of Big Chief writing tablets. I recorded the alphabet and other lessons on my miniature tape recorder, recorder and played them for Terry at every chance. Two years later, Terry was reading classic first grade books like Fun with Dick and Jane. We decided to investigate an innovative public school program called mainstreaming, where handicapped children would go to school with normal kids but have their own special ed classes. Looking over Terry's records, the administrator was dubious that Terry would qualify for the experimental program. We told him we thought Terry could handle mainstreaming. After all, she could read. The administrator gave Terry a preliminary test and shaking his head in disbelief, he said, given her condition, how in the world did she learn to read? My mother's message was direct. Our 12 year old daughter taught her. Over the years, the challenges became life as we knew it. Terry was finally resigned to the fact that she'd use a wheelchair for the rest of her life, but her spirit was anything but limited. One of my favorite memories was singing with Terry. She put us all to shame. She couldn't balance a checkbook, but she could remember the lyrics to any song after hearing it once and sing it in perfect pitch. Collectively, our family's awareness and level of compassion were heightened. But Terry blessed me in other ways I couldn't appreciate at the time. Today, I realize three lessons I would never have learned without Terry as a sister. I hope you find a source of power from the wisdom Terry imparted by living her life her way. Challenge assumed constraints. You may have heard the example of training baby elephants. The trainer puts a heavy chain around the elephant's leg, attaches it to a stake in the ground, and the baby elephant wants to get away pulling and tugging to no avail. Years pass and the elephant is now a six ton behemoth who can easily pull out the stake and escape, but he doesn't even try. His assumed constraint, a belief based on past experience that limits your current experience, keeps him tied down. Assumed constraints are insidious. They hold us back without our conscious awareness. I know this from personal experience. As a young girl, I wanted to be a dancer. My family couldn't afford lessons, but I danced in school musicals or any chance I could find. After performance, the local dance instructor offered me a scholarship to her studio. I was beyond excited. 
I remember walking the two miles to the studio and back, feeling lucky if a friend or neighbor saw me and gave me a ride. One day after class, Miss Cooper said she needed to talk. I know you love to dance, Susie, she stated the obvious. I shook my head vigorously in agreement. Oh, I do, I do. Miss Cooper continued with stark seriousness. That's why I feel I need to be honest with you. Honey, you're never going to make it as a dancer. You're just not built for it. You're too short. I don't remember the rest of that conversation. I do remember home that evening crying as I looked at the dancers in my books and thinking, she's right. Why haven't I ever noticed this before? All these dancers are tall and thin. Their necks are longer than my whole body. What was I thinking? That night I gave up dance. I took up activities better suited for a short muscular girl, but I still loved dancing. So I was thrilled in 1970 to get a standing room only view of Martha Graham's performance. Recognized as the mother of modern dance, she was on her farewell, farewell tour. As an employee of the university theater that was sponsoring the event, I knew people who could help sneak me backstage. Hiding behind a curtain just six feet from the grand dame, grand dame, anyway, the great lady, I realized she was just over five feet tall. I had given up on a dream because someone I respected had told me I was too short. I vowed on the spot, I will never allow anyone to kill my dreams again. But of course I did. I succumbed to assumed constraints. Many of us fall into the trap of assumed constraints for existence, excuse me, for instance, by listening to our parents warning us not to take risks, to follow the guidance of experts, like I did when the visiting professor told our college class that Wall Street was no place for a woman and encouraged me to change my major from finance to marketing. We listen to friends who give us questionable relationship advice. You know, they aren't warning, guiding, or advising to burden us with assumed constraints purposely. They're attempting to protect us with mostly good intentions, even if ill-conceived. Terry didn't have assumed constraints. She had real ones. I still remember our utter dismay when we couldn't get Terry in her wheelchair out of the car or back in because parking spaces were too narrow. We had to give up on a shopping trip countless times because the wheelchair couldn't make it through the store's aisles or into a restroom stall. Based on my first-hand experience, I should have been better prepared for a phone call after, excuse me, a phone call I received in the late 70s. At the time, I landed a plum job as an account executive at an award-winning ad agency, handling one of Denver's largest and most prestigious advertising accounts. Then one day, I received a call from an advocacy group asking me to include actors with disabilities in our clients' television and print ads. I vividly remember the conversation. My response, I'm sorry, but my job is to create ads for my client that attract customers. Our target market isn't handicapped and most people can't relate to disabled people in ads. Ouch. As compassionate as I might be, I was not a trailblazer on the issues of accessibility or equal rights. Despite seeing the problems faced by people with disabilities firsthand, I was chained to an assumed constraint for fear of offending clients or anyone I didn't think could understand or would appreciate being on the cutting edge of a social issue. I regret to say that I didn't embrace one of Terry's gifts until the passage of the ADA, the American Disabilities Act in 1990. The law which assured equal rights for disabled people glaringly illuminated my limited thinking. I renewed the commitment I had made to myself earlier to examine my beliefs, explore my values, and embrace the power generated by challenging assumed constraints. Move beyond self-awareness to mindfulness. Terry was self-aware. How could she not be? People stared in curiosity and often looked at her with pity for being so different. Research reveals that less than 15% of us are self-aware despite our human longing for meaning and relevance. 
If you're reading this, you're, or listening in this case, you are probably among the small group seeking a deeper understanding of your meaning and place in the world. But research also finds that self-aware people are the least happy and satisfied. Self-awareness, like a mirror, reflects our imperfections, often leading to private and public self-consciousness and social anxiety. Being self, oh, excuse me, being self-aware requires inner fortitude to deal with what you discover. Terry and her comrades in wheelchairs are perfect examples. The Rocky Mountain and uh, local tel uh, uh, news, excuse me, radio uh, station had a news story published in July 2021, and it portrays the situation better than I can. So this is from their news story. Denver. Monday, July 5th, 2021, marks the 43rd anniversary of a watershed moment in the disability rights movement. On July 5th and 6th in 1978, 19 individuals from Atlantis and the ADAPT community blocked the busy intersection of Broadway and Colfax in downtown Denver in a protest against the lack of wheelchair accessibility for RTD buses. The disability activists who became known as the Gang of 19 blocked traffic and chanted, we will ride until the city and RTD agreed to make the buses accessible to people with wheelchairs. Today, a plaque at Broadway and Colfax commemorates the activists' efforts. These are the names of the Gang of 19. And in my book, I honor the Gang of 19. And of course, my sister Terry Fowler's name is on the list. Thanks to the efforts of the Gang of 19, Denver became one of the first cities in the country with accessible mass transit. The protests from the ADAPT community, however, didn't end there. In 2018, the Colorado Experience took a deep dive into the history of the Gang of 19 and how their activism contributed to the passage of the Americans with Disability Act in 1990. Thousands of able-bodied, as Terry referred to them, <laughs> supported the Gang of 19. People like Wade Bush founded Atlantis where Terry and most of the Gang of 19 held jobs. His dream was to create a liberated community, a society where human beings could live in equality and develop the power to affect change. They were woke before the term existed. Now there's a backlash to the concept of being woke. People disparage wokeness as self-righteous or overly progressive on social issues they can't possibly understand. But I applaud those who refuse to get stuck in self-awareness and judgment. Those who awaken through mindfulness to non-judgment and empathy, who compassionately take action to ease other people's burdens, and in doing so, ironically, unload their own. Terry and her tribe made a real difference in the world. Now car lots have accessible parking spaces. Public transportation has lifts for wheelchairs. Buildings have ramps and restrooms have at least one stall with enough space for a wheelchair to maneuver. I wish I had awakened sooner to join them. Self-awareness tends to focus on judgment. Terry didn't consciously evolve from self-awareness to mindfulness. I noticed Terry's self-awareness when pushing her wheelchair down the street, but I'm embarrassed how long it's taken me to appreciate how she had also mastered the skill of mindfulness. Significantly, Terry learned to love herself despite the world's judgments by mindfully not judging herself or others in return. Acting on my imperfect self with love and devoid of judgment isn't always easy. As Albert Camus wrote, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion to be free from judgment. So your existence is an act of rebellious love, requires mindfulness. I'm still unwrapping Terry's powerful gift of mindfulness. Proof exists that you matter, but you don't need it. Five-year-old me could never have imagined writing about the difference Terry made in the world. What are the odds that a paralyzed, brain-damaged child of a lower-income family would find the power to be part of history? Terry's life mattered. Do you wonder if you matter? I do. 
in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, the angel Clarence comes to Earth with the job of preventing the down and out George Bailey from committing suicide. Clarence finally convinces George that his life matters through flashbacks and a projection of what his community be, would be like if he had never been born. George cries in gratitude, returning to his family and friends. In 1998, 52 years after its original release, the American Film Institute named It's a Wonderful Life the most inspirational American film of all time. What is it about the movie that resonates with so many? Motivation science reveals that one of our foundational psychological needs is a sense of connection. To feel that we contribute to the greater good and that our lives have meaning. Lucky George Bailey had an angel to provide compelling evidence that his life mattered. But how do you know if your life matters? What would you accept as proof? Maybe I should just acknowledge the wisdom that every life matters and that God doesn't make junk. But like Church Bailey, I thought I needed evidence. One day, excuse me, one of my favorite lines in a movie comes from the actor Jack Nicholson's character in As Good As It Gets. He looks lovingly into the eyes of his girlfriend, played by actress Helen Hunt, and tells her, you make me want to be a better man. Terry did that for me. She made me want to be a better woman, person, human being. If Terry had never done another thing except me, just one person, want to be a better human being, is that enough proof that she mattered? I think so. But it's easier to see how someone else's life matters than it is to grasp the significance of your own. After 70 years on the planet, I have no idea how to answer the question for myself. Do I matter? What would I accept as proof? So I've stopped asking the question and looking for evidence. Instead, I decided to cherish the gift Terry gave me. Do the best with what I have. Work hard and love deeply. I am finally learning to appreciate the power of inspiring someone, one person to be their best self. An awakening. Terry died suddenly. She fell from a wheelchair, probably from encephalitis, a virus that attacked her spine. She never regained consciousness. Well, that's not entirely true. She laid in the hospital bed, intubated on a ventilator, her eyes clouded in a milky white haze. I whispered that she had lived an extraordinary life and it was okay to let go. At that moment, the clouds cleared. She looked at me with bright blue eyes and a single tear fell down her cheek. Then the glaze returned and two hours later, we pulled her off life support. Hundreds of people crowded into a meeting hall for Terry's hastily but lovingly planned memorial service. They weren't there to honor an activist, but to pay respect to a sweet, gentle, loving spirit as my brother remarked, Terry is the only person I ever knew who couldn't lie if she wanted to. She was guileless. I couldn't comprehend the depth of my pain until I realized that she was the only person I had ever loved unconditionally, without expectations. I had just loved her and felt loved by her. Devastated, I shared the empty emptiness with a friend who had been orphaned at an early age and reared in 20 different foster homes. Deborah, how do you do it? How have you managed to keep going after so much loss in your life? I feel a hole in my heart so huge it will never heal. Deborah replied, Susan, the hole in your heart never goes away. You need to build a bigger heart around it. My life shifted at that moment. I embraced the pain as a symbol of having loved deeply. How sad would it be to not feel the loss of your sister? It's not easy, but I endeavor to love unconditionally every day, taking Deborah's words literally to heart. Some people make loving them really, really hard. <laughs> but when I accept that every woman is my sister, loving becomes easier. My mother was right to tell five-year-old Susan that her sister was a beautiful gift. Terry taught me to challenge assumed constraints, 
go beyond self-awareness to mindfulness and to let go of seeking proof that my life matters. But in the end, Terry's greatest gift was teaching me to love. My gift in return is to build a heart expansive enough to share Terry's spirit with my sisters around the world. What if all our sisters turned our collective pain to unconditional love? I am in awe thinking of the power that we could unleash if we built a bigger heart together. Thank you for listening to my story and I hope that you will take the time to get this book, You Matter, it's on Amazon and other places where you can buy books online. And I hope that you will be inspired as I have been by the women's stories in this book. Thank you.